this changes people's lives. And so I'm a huge supporter of these programs and their ability to shape the world and to open new doors for people around the world. The Center for Diplomatic Engagement serves as an educational and networking hub for diplomats to engage with the U.S. government and business community to look for solutions to shared global challenges. Glad to have you at Meridian. It's great to, great to be back. I think it's a wonderful center to bring people together from all over the world who have an understanding of global issues and uh, can share perspectives, try to find common ground. There's huge benefits for people um, working in a global institution and have the ability to go and live in different cultures and get experiences around the world. This changes people's lives and so I'm a huge supporter of these programs and their ability to shape the world and to open new doors for people around the world. The Center for Diplomatic Engagement serves as an educational and networking hub for diplomats to engage with the U.S. government and business community to look for solutions to shared global challenges. Glad to have you at Meridian. It's great to, great to be back. I think it's a wonderful center to bring people together from all over the world who have an understanding of global issues and uh, can share perspectives, try to find common ground. There's huge benefits for people um, working in a global institution and have the ability to go and live in different cultures and get experiences around the world. This changes people's lives and so I'm a huge supporter of these programs and their ability to shape the world and to open new doors for people around the world. The Center for Diplomatic Engagement serves as an educational and networking hub for diplomats to engage with the U.S. government and business community to look for solutions to shared global challenges. Glad to have you at Meridian. It's great to, great to be back. I think it's a wonderful center to bring people together from all over the world who have an understanding of global issues and uh, can share perspectives, try to find common ground. There's huge benefits for people um, working in a global institution and have the ability to go and live in different cultures and get experiences around the world. This changes people's lives and so I'm a huge supporter of these programs and their ability to shape the world and to open new doors for people around the world. The 
The Center for Diplomatic Engagement serves as an educational and networking hub for diplomats to engage with the U.S. government business community to look for... Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Meridian. Um, we're delighted you're here. I know that uh, there will be more uh, people joining us uh, this afternoon. Happy New Year. Um, for those of you that have not been to Meridian uh, before, we are a center for diplomatic engagement and global leadership and have been working... Uh, very closely with the State Department uh, since 1960 to help strengthen our uh, relationships with other countries through uh, leadership exchanges, uh, our convening, as well as our cultural diplomacy activities. And this is a very important subject today that's, that's near and dear to our hearts, which is sort of redefining uh, diplomacy uh, at the state and local level at, at a time when it, it's increasingly important. We are grateful today to be partnering with Brookings Center for S Sustainable Development, uh, and uh, particularly with Tony Pippa, who's with us here, and you'll hear uh, from him, and Max Boucher as well. Uh, the program is on the record. We have a large uh, virtual audience, um, and we will be reserving ample time for Q&A and uh, for those of you joining us virtually, please put your question uh, for the panel into the Q&A uh, mode for, for Zoom. Um, we are waiting also, I think, for the, uh, the Mayor of Phoenix, who will be joining us uh, as well. Um, we have seen that uh, our foreign policy, um, as defined traditionally, is, is directly linked to uh, what we are doing uh, here at home and uh, that we see uh, cities and states emerge as global actors in diplomacy where we can see their evolving impact on everything from uh, trade and investment and business development to climate change mitigation and global health among many other subjects. We look forward to exploring those avenues today and we'll, we will also uh, be examining different models of, of sustainable excuse me, subnational diplomacy around the world. We're delighted to have our good friend, uh, the ambassador of Argentina, as well with us. Uh, in 2023, subnational diplomacy will be a major theme for Meridian. Uh, we will be focusing our annual uh, diplomacy forum on April 11th and 12th on that subject. So please uh, stay tuned and mark that on your calendar. Uh, it will be titled, All Diplomacy is Local, Strengthening City and State Statecraft. Um, yes. Right up, right up your alley, Ambassador. Um, we, uh, we're joined by a, a wonderful panel today. Uh, the Ambassador of Argentina, uh, His Excellency Jorge Aguayo, um, who also serves as a member of the Meridian Diplomatic Engagement Advisory Committee and is serving his second tour, I believe, back in Washington. So you know us well, sir. Maybe you can explain us to ourselves. Um, we, we also have uh, Ambassador Nina Hashigian, who uh, I got to know uh, through her work, first uh, as, as uh, representing the United States at, at ASEAN, um, and, and her work prior to that with Center for American Progress in RAND, and she is uh, taking the inaugural role as the first U.S. Special Rep Representative for Subnational Diplomacy. And I also had the opportunity to see her in action in Los Angeles. Uh, where she did a terrific job working with uh, Mayor and do we say Ambassador Garcetti yet? Soon. Um, and, uh, and, and she is uh, helping Secretary Blinken uh, execute the agenda uh, of, our, of our foreign policy, again, looking at state and local. And I'd like to also make a comment about our moderator, Tony uh, Pippa. He is a senior fellow in the Center for Sustainable Development at Brookings. He launched and leads the Local Leadership on the Sustainable Development Goals Initiative and spearheaded much of their work on city diplomacy. Tony came to Brookings after serving as Chief Strategy Officer at USAID and Special Envoy at the State Department to negotiate the Sustainable Development Goals at the UN. So uh, we, we are grateful for you uh, for being here on a Tuesday, it feels like a Monday. Uh, by the way, um, I hope everybody had the opportunity to reflect on uh, Dr. King's legacy and, and his great lessons for us, uh, which actually translate into, into diplomacy as well as 
our ongoing efforts to improve our society and make it more equitable and inclusive here at home. So I'm going to turn it over to Nina, and uh, thank you again for being here, and then you will hear from the rest of the group. Thank you. I don't think I need this guy. Oh, this you've guy. Got Hello, everybody. It is great to be here with my Brookings and my Meridian friends and all of you and all of you online. Hi. Uh, thank you to Ambassador Holiday, Frank Justice and the Meridian team for hosting us here today as well as Tony Pippa and Max Boucher and their team. Tony and Max built on the long uh, tradition of Brookings doing excellent city work and foreign policy analysis and they brought those two things together and created a unique program which supported cities in tracking their progress toward the sustainable development goals. And they also helped to envision this role that I currently have. Um, I'm proud that LA was uh, one of the first cities to track the, our SDG progress in a very data-centric and vigorous way. Uh, and the person who led that work is Erin Bromagem, who might join us later. Uh, she is now the second deputy mayor for international affairs uh, under LA's new mayor, Karen Bass. Uh, mayor Bass is the first woman uh, in a city that's a few centuries old, so that's an important milestone for us all. What we can take, or what I take from this set of events is that progress starts with having a vision and taking risks. It was not politically advisable, I would say, for Mayor Garcetti to appoint a deputy mayor and create a whole office of uh, global engagement on behalf of the city. I was the only deputy mayor at the time doing international affairs. Um, that might still be the case, actually, in the United States. So with a few exceptions, only um, the only people who cheered in 2017 when this happened were the 100 or so non-voting consuls general who finally knew where they could go if they needed something from the city. Um, but over time, we delivered jobs, international experiences, and skills for students, global problem solving, especially on climate, a 2028 Olympics uh, games agreement with legacy commitments, a major diplomatic summit, LA's first, if you can believe that, um, with all the business that it brought, a lot of constituent services, and um, all of that uh, did and does benefit the people of Los Angeles. It's still true, though, that mayors and governors may take political risks when they travel abroad or when they welcome a foreign delegation, um, because in the United States, these endeavors are not yet seen as inherent uh, responsibilities of good local leaders. But of course, I think they are, or they should be. Three quarters of the world's purchasing power, over 95% of the world's consumers are outside the United States. Jobs from foreign companies often pay better and they're more stable. Uh, and it's a global competition to see where uh, headquarters and production facilities land. Diaspora communities want to know from their leaders about what's happening in their countries of origin and where their friends and families still may live. And they also want to help, as the Ukrainian-American uh, community today is showing. Leaders also need to equip young people with global skills and opportunities for them to land the good jobs of the future. Uh, and most of all, leaders abroad sometimes have great ideas on how to solve local problems, which our local leaders can benefit from. And that goes the other way, of course, as well. But bus rapid transit lines came from uh, Curitiba, Brazil, for example, and now you see them all over the United States. All local leaders in the United States are also solving global problems, problems that affect us all, like climate change, like COVID-19 and pandemics in general, fighting off cyber attacks, combating human trafficking, and threats to critical infrastructure. So much of this work is funded and led by the federal government, but mayors and governors are the boots on the ground, the innovators, the keepers of the knowledge about the best way to effectively solve these problems. They decide that their city's grid is going to be powered by renewables, for example. And then the city and state workers have to figure out the money, help create the plan, dig the dirt, buy the equipment, uh, and install it so that you actually 
translate what the goals are to actually what's happening in the physical world. But I think that the creation of my team, I'm hoping, is a sign that increasing numbers of people understand this reality. Um, and of course, the National Security Strategy Report from this year reflects it so well as it tries to break down the domestic and foreign policy silos. Um, to, I hope, uncharacteristically toot my own horn, I will say that this was a theme of a book that uh, Mona Sutphan and I wrote in 2007, that if we invested at home, that we would be well equipped to handle the rise of other powers, and President Biden is doing just that. So what I thought I would tell you is what's happening in these first three months that we've been uh, a team at the State Department, give you an early um, sit rep of what we know, what we don't know, what we hope to do. Uh, in the category of what we know, our work is gonna focus on three main goals. So the first is that my team and I um, want to serve as a conduit to local leaders in the United States, like Mayor Gallego, who just came in. Welcome, Mayor. Uh, um, to ensure that the department connects them to the tangible benefits of foreign policy. Uh, second, my team and I will encourage and support U.S. local leaders to engage internationally and with the department, and you'll hear again from Mayor Gallego who's doing a lot of that. Um, and third, the, my team and I will encourage the State Department to think in general uh, about engaging subnational actors wherever they are in the world, um, as well as the networks uh, and the multilater multilateral organizations that serve them as appropriate to advance uh, U.S. foreign policy and national security objectives. So we'll serve as conduits to local foreign leaders as well as necessary. Those three areas plus building the institution itself. So let me just start with the, with the last part of that first. So we have a small but mighty team, including but not yet on board a data scientist who will help us track our progress. And slowly but surely, uh, folks here and at U.S. embassies around the world are getting to know us. Those of you who know the U.S. State Department know that that itself can be a challenge because it's quite large. Um, and these are all the bits that you do with a, with a startup, um, and that includes choosing priorities. So let me go through these goals that I've mentioned and give you a little bit more detail. Um, so there are two benefits that flow from foreign policy that uh, American local leaders consistently uh, are interested in and request. Uh, job creating, uh, foreign direct investment, trade and international and trade and international opportunities for young people. So our goal is to help in the process of identifying economic opportunities, uh, particularly for underserved communities. We've also introduced uh, local leaders to um, the many opportunities that are available to young people through the State Department. Um, it's th through our international education and cultural programming, and we will continue to do that. When I was uh, deputy mayor in LA, we started a program called uh, MAYA, the Mayor's Young Ambassador Program, which sent about 175 college students, community college students, to 10 places for free. These were mostly people of color, 60% first generation to go to college, and 60% first generation American, for about a third their first time on an airplane. And um, some of those uh, students then applied for other programs and one spent six months in the UAE as a youth ambassador for the USA uh, Pavilion and the World Expo. So there are similar kinds of opportunities offered through the State Department and I want all mayors and governors to know about them. They are listed for those of you who want to know at exchanges.state.gov um, and we of course want our mayors and governors to help us find um, pockets of populations that haven't uh, had access or don't know about these programs. Second, what mayors and governors need to do more global education than they, global engagement than they currently do is three things. They need to build capacity. They need to have the actions be politically beneficial or at least not costly. And sometimes they need advice. On capacity, um, unlike foreign cities, which can have 100 people or more working just on an international portfolio for a big city, very few uh, American cities and governor's offices have international teams at all, let alone large ones. 
Um, so we're working on finding a way to restart a program that used to exist, um, which detailed foreign service officers to mayors and governor's offices. That will never be a ton of people. It will probably you know, be a handful, but it's a start. We've also started to coordinate with the Office of Foreign Missions that really wants to help us, and they cover the whole country from five regional offices. And we will be talking with diplomats and residents, to uh, alumni of the State Department, to try to um, help mayors and governors if they want that extra international capacity. On the politics, what we're hoping is that if a mayor can say that the State Department invited them to something or asked them to do something or they're in touch with us about you know, an upcoming trip, that, that might perhaps uh, make it somewhat easier. Uh, and as to advice, we are in very, very full swing on that front. Um, we field multiple requests every day from mayors and governor's offices, um, as well as from State Department folks, but um, asking for input on their plans and um, memorandums of understanding that they're signing, et cetera. Uh, they and, and their staff all have my and my deputy Danny's cell phone, and they use it regularly, which is exactly uh, what we want. And in April, we have an opportunity coming up for US mayors to wade into international waters without actually having to leave the United States. It's going to be the first ever City Summit of the Americas, and it'll be in Denver on April 26th to 28th, 24th to 26th, excuse me. No, it's 26th to 28th, actually, uh, is a government-led effort uh, and will convene city, state, municipal, and regional um, leaders throughout the Western Hemisphere to focus on shared challenges and opportunities um, alongside diverse stakeholders. The Western Hemisphere is the world's most urbanized region, and cities are innovation labs for addressing our shared challenge, challenges. Uh, the City Summit is designed to empower local governments, businesses, and community organizations to collaborate and develop new solutions uh, to challenges facing cities such as uh, climate, governance, the digital divide, and more. And we hope it will create a lasting mechanism for diplomatic engagement at the local level. So I look forward to seeing many of you in Denver. Finally, job three for my team is to encourage the State Department writ large into uh, thinking about and acting subnationally when it's useful to do that. Um, we know that by 2050, 80% of humanity will live in cities, up from 55% now. And we know that regional leaders in many places, uh, India, Malaysia, Mexico, Germany, South Africa, just to name a few, can be very powerful. So while not every issue lends itself to subnational strategy, many do. And we're beginning with two, which are climate and democracy, although other, many others are already um, coming to us. But climate is perhaps the best example. Even with a national leadership that might be resistant to decarbonization, a lot can happen at the local level. So we're working on a special presidential envoy climate for, for Climate Carries team uh, on several programs to engage local leaders who often have control over decarbonization through public transportation, sanitation, which is a big one for methane, power generation and uh, building efficiency codes, uh, and sometimes ports and airports also. We are also working with department colleagues to, on finding ways to highlight city leaders who want to support individual rights and the rule of law and transparency. Um, with partners, we're helping to collect mayor signatures for the, for the mayor global, mayor's global declaration on democracy. Um, and we hope to have a good number in time for the Summit on Democracy, which will be in March. So I'm really very much looking forward to the panel uh, discussion with my extremely distinguished co-panelists um, and know that I will learn a lot. So thank you all. So we, can, uh, we can move to the panel now. Um, I think I follow you, yeah? Yes. So Nina, why don't you be there, nice. Mayor Gallego, and then Ambassador. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Cool. So thank you, <laughs> thank you, Ambassador and Chigian, <laughs> for those remarks. My name is Tony Pippa, um, uh, from the Center for Sustainable Development at Brookings, as Ambassador uh, Holiday mentioned, and 
Thank you to him and thank you to Meridian International before we get underway uh, on this conversation. Uh, it's great to have an audience like this that are focused on uh, the diplomatic interests uh, of both the United States and, and what it might be for the world and, and have people in the audience like former Michigan governor and U.S. Ambassador to Canada, Jim Blanchard, who I know is here, and, and, um, and others <laughs> of you. And we look forward to your questions. We're going we're gonna to have a conversation uh, amongst us, and, and I know many of you are online. We're going to start with a little bit of a conversation amongst us. Uh, and then we'll switch to a conversation with questions and answers uh, with questions from you. Uh, and then ultimately, we'll also have some time together, some social time together uh, hosted by Meridian. So uh, really looking forward to this. But before we get too far into the panel, I just want to say a few words. Um, so you heard the introduction for uh, Special mm -hmm. Representative Hachigian. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, our other panelists. The first is... Um, Ambassador of Argentina, Jorge Agüero, uh, who um, became ambassador to the United States in February of 2020 for his second tour. He was also ambassador 2011 to 2012. Um, but he began his political career uh, as a member and then chairman of the City Council of Buenos Aires. Yep. So <laughs> brings his own experience directly, uh, local municipal government. Um, he has served uh, twice as a national congressman and has also worked extensively in the diplomatic field. In addition to being ambassador to the United States, has also been permanent representative to the United Nations. And we'll talk a little bit about global policy and where cities, the role that cities and local mm -hmm. governments can also play uh, in global governance institutions like the United Nations. Um, and then we're also very excited to have Mayor Kate Gallego, uh, who is the mayor of Phoenix, Arizona, the fifth largest city in the nation, uh, the second elected female mayor in Phoenix's history, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the youngest big city mayors in the United States. She Good. came to office in 2019, uh, and, then, uh, af and then returned, uh, was re-elected in 2020 with, I think, the largest votes, uh, <laughs> largest vote getter ever uh, <laughs> for mayor in Phoenix's history. Um, she's a strong advocate for smart business growth and investment, and is seeking uh, to ensure that Phoenix is the most sustainable desert city in the United States and also uh, globally recognized and globally prominent in the, in the work that's going on in Phoenix. <coughs> so looking forward to this conversation. And Ambassador, I'm going to start with you. We heard Special Representative Hachigian talk about the new subnational uh, mm -hmm. diplomacy unit at the State Department. Um, Argentinian cities and provinces are also very active at the international level. Um, there are strong ties even between cities and states between the U.S. and Argentina. And I know, for instance, that the cities of Rosario and St. Louis have a deep cultural mm. and ties on a broad range of issues, including bioresearch and agricultural industries. Um, and in fact, uh, a few months ago, your embassy helped lead a visit of 10 governors of the Norte Grande together to United mm -hmm. States. So talk to us a little bit about how, from your national government and your diplomatic perspective, you organize your diplomacy in partnership with and on behalf of um, cities and states in Argentina. Um, we, have a, we have an office now within the State Department. How does it work uh, for you and, and for Argentina? Well, Tony, uh, the first thing I should say is that, I don't know if you all know this, but Argentina is also a federal country. So in Argentina, we've, we have 23 provinces, 23 states, plus the city of Buenos Aires. I said plus the city of Buenos Aires because the Buenos Aires city, where I come from, uh, has become an autonomous um, district mm -hmm. since the uh, reform of our constitution in 1994. So now we say Argentina is a federal state composed of 23 provinces and this autonomous city of uh, Buenos Aires. Uh, in our federal system, the provinces, so the states, are the owners of the subsoil. They have their own constitution, they have their own resources, they own the subsoil, so 
if we have to talk, and I talk a lot about these two things here in the US, if we talk about lithium, for example, then you have to think of three provinces which are located up on in the northwest of our Argentina. The names are Salta, Catamarca, and Jujuy. Uh, these three provinces uh, are the, the have the, the 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 main reserves of lithium in Argentina, and Argentina has one of the most important reserves of lithium in in the world. We Argentina is part of what what is worldwide known as the lithium triangle. When we say the lithium triangle, we are talking about Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. Most of the reserves of lithium in the world are located in that place. But if we, if we think in gas and conventional gas or oil, then we, ha we should think of the Patagonian provinces, than south of my country, particularly the province of Neuquén, where the Vaca Muerta reserves, uh, which is one of the main reserves, known reserves uh, in, 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 in the field of unconventional gas and oil, uh, are known. So the provinces are the one who are in, char in charge of the regulation of these uh, resources. Uh, and uh, that's uh, very important, and I work a lot with investors from the U.S. that uh, do invest in Argentina, and uh, the first thing I do is a, a sort of a, a class, how does the decision-making process work in each one of the provinces and what the regula regulations are, are, are about. I arrived uh, for my second term. This is, as, as Tony said, I'm honored uh, being for the second time appointed ambassador to the US, of, of my country to the US. I arrived, I arrived to Washington in February 2020. I presented my credentials to the, the former president, Donald Trump, and then the COVID arrived. Uh -huh. So, we, we, uh, we working with the provinces and with the different cities of my country is clearly a priority of uh, my tenure here. So, we created in February 2020 a new program which is called Federal Agenda Program. What do we do? We work directly from the embassy in Washington, D.C. with each one of the provinces. With whom? with the governors with the, the, uh, and with their cabinet. So this program has gone through three different stages. Stage number one, COVID-19, impossible to travel, to go to Argentina or to come to the US. So we started the program working with uh, the governors uh, uh, through Zoom. No? So in the other side of the, of the screen, you had the governor, and their, uh, his or her uh, cabinet. On this side of the screen, it was this ambassador plus all the officials, the diplomatic officials. We prepared in advance uh, an agenda. We selected the different three, four main topics that we wanted to talk about, and then the, uh, the, the, the gathering took place. We did it with different provinces. I was writing here in a virtual manner. We did it with Entre Rios province, which is located in the middle of, of the country, bordering Uruguay, so in the east part of the country. We did it with Cordoba province. Cordoba is exactly in the middle of the country. We did it with Rio Negro province, which is located in the Patagonia down south. And we did it with Chaco, which is one of the northeast uh, provinces of Argentina. After the, the gathering, uh, we pick the responsibles to organize the consequences of the, of the gathering. No? So they follow up the different issues. Stage number one. Stage, stage number two. In the last part of the, the, the pandemic, I had the chance, I normally fly to, to Argentina because of work once every two months. So I started to visit the different provinces every time I went to Argentina, even though sometimes I go for three days. For example, I will be leaving to Argentina the day after tomorrow and I will be coming back on Monday. But uh, I made time 
to visit different provinces. So this is a stage two. I visited the provinces of Tucumán, up to north, uh, the province of Santiago del Estero, uh, uh, northwest uh, of Argentina, the province of Entre Rio uh, again, and I have a in-person gathering with the governor and the cabinet. And uh, the stage three is the one you mentioned, I think. A few months, a couple of months ago, we organized the visit of uh, 10 governors from Argentina. They all belong to the same region. So uh, I, I'm, I, we are in perfect synchrony with uh, what Nina does. We brought this, the, we call it Norte Grande, which means Great North. 10 governors from the 10 provinces of the northern part of Argentina came together, visited Washington. As they spent three days here and two days in New York. What did they do? Everything. We took them to every uh, department of the executive branch, branch here. We had lots of meetings with Congress people and uh, with business uh, companies, uh, business uh, leaders, etc. And uh, after they, they, they ended the visit to Washington and New York, each one of them had a special uh, uh, visit to different states. So uh, my answer to your question in general is, for us, uh, dealing with the sub-regional realities, states or provinces or cities is a main, main task. And we are working a lot on that. And the important thing is, I belong to, the, of course, to our government. I am not a career diplomat. As Tony said, I, I'm a politician. I spent 20 years at different stages of the legislative branch. Twice I, was a, I, I became a federal uh, member of Congress, but I also was a member of the city council, member of the Buenos Aires legislature, uh, le legislature etc. Uh, so uh, as a politician, I have a very close and very good relationship with the different parts of the opposition. Mm. And that's important because always, we always, that uh, a, a, we, o always when we, we organize this kind of activities, uh, we do it with members of the government and members of the opposition. And that uh, makes it really uh, work in a very, very positive uh, work way. That's, thank you very much for, for that. And, it, and it's clear from your remarks, kind of the partnership actually there between the national government, you as a, yeah. as a diplomat on behalf of the national government and the provinces and the jurisdictions themselves. Um, and the value that you see actually for, for promoting um, Argentina's interests here. So Mayor Gallego, let me turn to you and hear about your vision and the work that you, you see for Phoenix um, and the value that you see for engaging globally in the way that I think we just heard the ambassador talk about some of the provinces as well. Why engage globally? Why, wh what is it that you want for Phoenix um, out of that engagement? Wonderful, thank you for having me and having this important conversation. Before I ran for office, I worked in economic development trying to bring high wage jobs to Phoenix and grow the companies that were there. One of my formative experiences in my life was the 2008 housing crash. I bought my first home in the single month peak of the housing oh. market in Phoenix and never built equity. <laughs> and so you just see your very limited personal wealth disappear. Phoenix at the time was very dependent on the home building industry. We had many of the large publicly traded home building companies. That was a lot of our jobs and economy. And I have since then just been very passionate about having a more diverse economy. To me, international work is one of the most important ways mm. that I can help and support that. Uh, Phoenix was on the front page of several international newspapers in December when Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation announced their $40 billion investment in Phoenix. So the brains of the iPhone and many other great mm -hmm. products are gonna be made in Phoenix. That investment took every level of government and decades of a foundation. Phoenix has had 
a more than 40 year relationship with Taipei as our sister city. Hmm. Uh, before my time, but I understand it came out of the era when Barry Goldwater represented us and he did the Taiwan Relations mm -hmm. Act. And he was a veteran of the Phoenix City Council and helped the then mayor develop the sister city relationship. Uh, a strange experience is to go to a foreign country and be thanked for things that Barry Goldwater did. <laughs> <laughs> but I accept it on behalf of the people of Phoenix. <laughs> we have, have really maintained that strong relationship with Taipei and Taiwan. So much of the diplomacy they do is through sister cities, so they have a very robust program that is quite sophisticated because they don't use necessarily this traditional embassy relationship. Our investments in that area were very helpful. Uh, we've also trained a lot of pilots who have come and, and mm. served the Taiwanese community. Phoenix has 320 degrees of sunny days. And so we train a lot of the world's pilots in Phoenix and that's a chance for so much of the world to see Phoenix and often develop long-term relationships. Those relationships, again, help us be a stronger economy. And I cannot sort of overstate how much the TSMC investment is changing our city. Right now they're in construction phase. It's a small city with its own, basically with its own cement plant. Uh, 19,000 people will work in construction. Those jobs pay enormously well. As the semiconductor industry hires so many of the top people in construction, there's new apprenticeship opportunities and we're seeing incredibly robust hiring including for people who really struggled to get jobs in the past. Um, so we have very aggressive DUI laws in Arizona, and we have a lot of people who had felony DUI convictions who struggled to get a job. I understand this is a charged issue, but I believe a DUI should not end your economic possibilities. And so for me, it's exciting to see people who have felonies being able to go in the construction. They're not automatically going straight to semiconductors, but because of the uptake in the industry they have a chance to get a job that has a great salary where you can take your kids on vacation and, and be optimistic about the future. And when people, when a felony is not an end to your economic possibilities, it's a safer city for everyone. So to me, that started with foreign policy and shows up at the local level. Um, a union carpenter may not feel like he's living the benefits of foreign policy, but that's what it seems like it is for me. Um, we worked with every level of government to try to get this deal done. So our school district, where they're located, has our longest serving Mandarin program in the state of Arizona, and they stepped up to welcome people who were coming from Taiwan. Uh, we worked with the Commerce Department, State Department, and others. Uh, sometimes I needed a little bit of assistance as a, it was my first international trip as mayor was to Taiwan. And at the big meal where we were trying to seal the deal with TSMC, um, they served course after course of food and they were all sitting on the table and um, it smelled amazing. I'm a big fan of fried food and there was a lot of that. And everyone was just sitting there. And then someone had to tell me that I had to eat first or no one would eat. So I was like <laughs> starving the TSMC executives uh, because I wasn't taking the first bite. I was a first year mayor. I didn't, I needed a little protocol assistance, shall we call it. Um, I'm going to benefit very much from the Office of Subnational diplomacy, but I think if I'd starved the TSMC executives, that might not have been good for <laughs> our, our future prospects. And it was like the, US, the guy from the U.S. Commercial Service who was like giving me a little bit of hand-holding yeah. in that area. So thankfully, we had that partnership and right. the subnational diplomacy to change the lives for people in Phoenix. Uh, I just made my third trip to Argentina in November. Oh, you did? Good. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, that was around climate change work. So I am the uh -huh. U.S. Vice Chair for C40, which is a global uh -huh. mayor's okay. organization around climate change. And Buenos Aires hosted our... So you know Horacio Rodriguez. I do, <laughs> yes. He did a wonder job of hosting. But he yes. also brought in mayors from all over the country. Yes. And so I... Um, we The day before the C40 meeting started, they did a more Argentina focused convening, but they were very kind to invite me to speak. Good. And I was able to talk to mayors from all over Argentina. And when yeah. we have a lot of ties between our communities, so Phoenix is a big aerospace town. Honeywell creates, uh, manufactures engines in Phoenix that are now, many of them going to Argentina where they also have a strong aerospace industry. And so if they have a strong aerospace industry and keep hiring 
are buying engines from Phoenix, then we can keep hiring and growing. And so, it, again, those are great jobs building engines, many of which do not require a college degree and, and pay way better than mayor of Phoenix. And that's enabled by our partnerships sure. with Argentina. So it wasn't just climate change, although we talked a lot about mayor things. We have a cool pavement program where <laughs> we paint the streets a lighter colored coating and we found it's about 10 degrees cooler. And there, I think some cities in Argentina mm -hmm. that may do the same thing. So we were trading very mayor ideas. Uh, there's lots of stereotypes that mayors think a lot about potholes, and in our case, they are true. And we were doing them at the, the international level. And we got some ideas. I think we are going to build a bridge very similar to one they have that out of recycled plastics, because we're very into mm -hmm. circular economy and reducing landfills. And mm -hmm. it was gorgeous. And just be able to talk to the local government folks in Argentina makes me better at my job. So it's been a win for, I hope, the people of Phoenix, but certainly for me as mayor. So, so special representative Hachigi, uh, we just heard a couple of, so that knowledge exchange, first off, is one of the things we hear all the time about uh, the value of mayors engaging globally. And we also heard the ambassadors talk about, and, and actually Mary Diego, talk about the economic benefits as well, right, of that mm -hmm. engagement. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got 50 states, we've got a lot of cities within those states as well. You know, and you talked a little bit about the capacity constraints that I think most U.S. cities and states also, um, in trying to engage globally, face, especially relative to other other countries of our ilk um, in Europe or or um, like in Argentina and others. Um, talk to us a little bit more. You talked about trying to revive the fellowship, but talk to us a little bit more about how you're thinking to engage and manage that engagement um, with U.S. cities and states. Um, and then also, will you, how will you, be, will you be engaging with cities and states globally as well? Like, what's the, what's the vision there? Yeah, good question. Um, we are going to be tracking our engagement. I don't know how much we're going to be managing it, I in the sense that we, we're going to try, we are trying, and but through you know events like this, we'll continue to try to put the word out there that we exist and that we're here for mayors, we're here for governors. We have an easy to uh, remember email address, it's subnational at state.gov. Um, tomorrow, for the first time ever, a Secretary of State will be speaking at the U.S. Conference of Mayors. So that's happening tomorrow morning, and um, Secretary Blinken will be there. So we're we're trying to get the word out that we're here, and then we will you know, do our best to provide whatever folks who come to us want. And we already have a lot of incoming demand. So we will work with anybody. Um, we don't want to, we're, we're not yet at the point where we're going to be able to convince someone who's firmly against doing anything international that they mm -hmm. should. But we will try to demonstrate through mayors like this one uh, why you might want to do that. It certainly helps the United States as well to have mayors out uh, in the global arena. They are, you know, f force multipliers for us and, and bring with them all kinds of, um, they bring their, you know, American values and all kinds of soft power along with them. And that's to the good for the United States. So, but we are huge and my team is small. And so we can't do everything. So we will be working with folks who ask us for help um, mm -hmm. mostly by trying to get the word out as widely as we can that we're around and we really do want to help. Um, so, and we will have, you know, senior level officials from the State Department traveling in the United States as well. We'll use all those engagements um, also to, to spread the word. Um, but we do, uh, and what I've noticed, and Mayor Gallego can correct me, is mayors tend to talk with one another a lot. So once a few mayors know that we're around, soon a lot of mayors will know that we're around. Um, I, I, I feel that word of mouth is a big way that mayors uh, interact with, with each other it's, and with, with, you know, learn about opportunities. Um, but to hear about this ex perfect example of the technical sharing that I just think is so magical and happens so frequently when mayors get together and uh, can learn from each other about the plastic recycled bridge or cool pavement or any number of other 
<clears throat> you know, really innovative things that cities do to solve to solve problems. Um, and so the City Summit of the Americas will be another kind of big mm. moment where we hope to, to bring a lot of mayors, and that's low cost, it's, it's domestic, and yet you'll get to meet a lot of international counterparts. So um, that's another way we can kind of bring, you know, more people in. And yes, we will be working with... Um, we, you know, I've been asked already a lot to go travel and meet with um, with subnational leaders around around the world. Um, sometimes it's a matter, you know, sometimes our embassies will know them and sometimes they won't. And, you know, just depending on the situation, we can connect or they can. Um, but, you know, we do we do have the advantage, um, you know, of having embassies everywhere. So that that helps in terms of reaching out to subnational leaders. And I found that there are. Uh, you know, a good chunk of folks in the State Department who, for one reason or another, have been keyed in on this and are really eager to start doing stuff. So that's, uh, that's you know, been wonderful also. That's wonderful. Well, Mayor Gago, let me go back to you because you were talking about that technical exchange. So you were at, t t again, just, to, re just mm -hmm. to review, you were in Buenos Aires for the C40 uh, Summit of Mayors. Um, C40 is a city-to-city -city network where major cities in the world come together to collectively make progress on climate change. Um, and so that's the, that's the backdrop for that particular gathering. Um, so you talked about that technical exchange and just learning from each other. And we hear that a lot about the pragmatic, these are solutions, you ought to try it out, here's something you can do. But there's also sort of a policy perspective to this as well, right? There's a lot of global policy around climate change. There's, you know, what's happening at the COP and what nation states are trying to agree upon. And, and um, so from your perspective, what's the value for Phoenix of like engaging in that policy conversation as well with your fellow mayors from around the world, not just in the US, but even from around the world. Um, and, and how do you see that as intersecting with kind of US foreign policy or even just sort of global policy? be interesting to get your perspective on that. It's been enormously valuable for us in Phoenix. So Phoenix is the fifth largest city in the country, but maybe not known for that outside of the United States. When I travel internationally, it's very surprising to people that we're the fifth largest city. And so this helps us get in places where we would not be able to be otherwise and, and partnerships. Uh, we, some of it is economic, so we have several incubators around sustainable technologies and companies, companies uh, one around the circular economy, where we've seen a lot of interest in companies that want to set up a US outpost and normally would look, frankly, look at new, the coasts. But because we're in the room and, and they know we care and we take very seriously climate change and people understand why, we take it seriously because we have real challenges with heat. They see we're motivated, we're gonna support them. Maybe we do wanna locate in Phoenix. Uh, we feel like a little bit of a startup city. And so we are hungry for their business and we'll earn it. Um, we've also gotten really important technologies that help us address our challenges. Water management is enormously important to us and we just did a great partnership with an Israeli company that's a generation ahead of where we are to monitor our water system and reduce leak detection. So just knowing what tools are out there earlier can be very helpful to us and address our real challenges. Uh, for me as, a, as a, uh, someone who's an elected official when the US pulled out of the Paris Accords, being able to step up at a subnational level was an a really personally meaningful, but also I'm a mom and I want to leave behind a better planet for my son so that we could say as U.S. cities, we don't agree with the direction that our national government is going mm. in and we are going to lead here. Um, I'm part of Climate Mayors, which is 400 U.S. mayors that are committed to the Paris Accords and then also one of the two North American leaders for C40. And I got to be part of the first day at the convening in Glasgow where we announced the municipal commitments to address climate change. For much of the convening in Glasgow, cities were mm -hmm. the largest commitment. And that's a real point of pride that we're part of the solution and that we are leading the way. While many national governments are not meeting their Paris commitments, there are a lot of cities that are. And so that's how we're gonna solve these great challenges that our planet 
faces and, and that is valuable. We've um, committed to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I think that's a major area of expertise for you. I think we were the second city after Los Angeles and we really studied what Los Angeles was doing. Um, that has given us access to new resources to achieve those goals. As the mayor of Phoenix, I did not know how to contact the United Nations or the United Nations Foundation. I, and now when we join these conversations, we get a whole lot of resources that we didn't have before and important recognition as well. So it's been a great success from my perspective. So, um, um, so thank you, that's, uh, and that's wonderful. And it's wonderful to hear um, just sort of that collective engagement and the collective engagement on policy issues. But I want to pick up on one thing, because you were also talking about when the U.S. pulled out of the Paris Accords. And Ambassador, let me turn to you. Um, from a national, you've been a permanent rep to the U.N. To, yeah. to, um, so you understand sort of the, that policy environment and, and the negotiations that happen to come up with that kind of policy. Um, you've got Buenos Aires playing a major role in hosting the Summit of Mayors and mayors like Mayor Gallego coming down to collectively talk about their commitments around climate change. How is like those actions of Buenos Aires both a force multiplier potentially mm -hmm. for your national foreign policy, mm -hmm. but then also what happens when it contradicts your foreign mm -hmm. policy as mm -hmm. well? Like, How do you think about that from a national government perspective? Yeah. Thank you, Tony. That's a good question. Can you listen to me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to stress something that Kate uh, has said. Buenos Aires is one of the world's most active global cities. And that's the reason why the Buenos Aires mayor, uh, Horacio Rodriguez Larreta, who belongs to the opposition party, uh, is uh, the vice president of the C40. The C40 is a very, very interesting and growing experience all over the world. They started being only 40 uh, cities, and uh, in Buenos Aires last October, they, were, they gathered more than 100 cities from the five continents, so from all over the world. And that's an amazing experience that is fully supported by the United Nations or organization, of course. Uh, what do they... They, they, call, they call the C40 also the uh, Climate Leadership Group, which is very important because climate change is one of the main, uh, the main um, desafios, the main challenges that the world uh, has, uh, has uh, in front of it. So the majors are committed in the reduction of uh, uh, carbon emissions, they are also committed in generating actions uh, oriented to the uh, adapting and mitigating uh, the climate crisis. And they do a, a, a great job. I'm trying to foresee, to, to see if there is any contradiction between what the mayor of the city of Buenos Aires is doing uh, contradictory with uh, the, the foreign policy of Argentina, but I, I cannot find anyone. Uh, I want you to know that the ministry, uh, as Nina has his position within the State Department, in our Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Argentina, we do have a, a, an undersecretary who is in charge of the policy, uh, the foreign policy that our country uh, manages with cities and with the, well, w with the uh, undernational uh, reality, no? subnational realities. So I, I don't see a contradiction. I, on the contrary, uh, let me tell you something. Recently we received the third or the fourth visit of the mayor of Buenos Aires City to Washington. And I was in charge of part of his agenda. <laughs> so even though he is going to be the candidate for the presidency this year, so we are going to strong to have a strong competition with him, <laughs> but we, we do work together. And that, that's something that I, I would like to, to stress. Uh, there is another chapter in this whole issue, which is the U20. I ah. want you to know, Tony ah, yes. and people, that uh, 
I am the in charge of the bilateral relationship Argentina US of course because I'm the ambassador to Washington but I have another hat and that other hat is I am the Sherpa of the Argentinian president mm. to the G20 mm. so that's the reason why I'm in permanent connection with the uh, the 20 countries that are with the at the at the G20 and the urban 20 is a growing reality at the G20 each year I can easily uh, see how uh, they are uh, uh, becoming more and more important in the mm -hmm. global discussions. Mm -hmm. And one That's of the main, main issues they have in charge, uh, of course, are the climate change uh, crisis. But uh, the U20 I is something very important, and I think we all should pay a lot of attention because we are not, not talking uh, about only national foreign policies, but subnational foreign policies. The U20 is a perfect place where to connect mm -hmm. all the subnational realities. Mm -hmm. So I'm working a lot uh, in, in that. Finally, I, I want to I wanna say something. I'm very proud. To be, I, 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 I visited the State Department this morning. I had my first meeting with uh, Nina and she told me that I was, I am the first ambassador she contacts uh -huh. the, from her new position. So we have a long way uh, to, 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 to work together. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, well, let me now turn to the audience and, and uh, ask for your questions. Uh, and I think we've got mics here. So uh, right there in the second to last row. Yes, there we go. Thank you. Thank you to the Meridian Center for having me. My name is Abigail Hunter. I work for the Quebec government office in Washington joined by my director who's sitting next to me. Um, before, thank you, uh, before working for uh, Quebec, I worked for the National Governors Association leading their international program for five years. So I know you've spoken a lot about the city technical assistance and best practice sharing, but I'd be curious to hear from you, um, Ambassador Hashigian, on how to manage the governor to governor, governor to premier relationships, or you know whatever the title is at the subnational level, uh, given the subnational governments, whether they be lender, prefecture, province, are tend to be a little bit different in terms of the responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So curious from that from my old job, but also to understand how we as a province can best engage with you in your office. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we're, we are, oh, do you want to oh, take no, one? No, 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 go ahead. Go okay, ahead. we are uh, absolutely as committed to governors as we are to mayors. My early impression, and I could be co corrected on this, is that a lot of them are really out there doing it. Um, and um, and may need less help and encouragement. They seem to, a lot of them anyway, seem to just be, um, uh, you know, have their priorities and, and, are, and are going for it. But we very much want to, um, you know, help any U.S. governor who might need any help um, or kibitz on whatever questions they have and absolutely help to connect them with, you know, appropriate uh, relationships. And, and I think... You know, my guess is you, because you're right that they all have different authorities and, and um, that's true even in this country actually, that different cities have different kinds of authorities and, and different uh, states do, but try to match them with ones that have, you know, similar kinds of priorities and, and whatnot. But um, so it's sort of the same, it's sort of the same, you know, uh, uh, process as it, as it would be for mayors. And Mayor Gallego, how do you sync up with like the governor of your state as you're doing, or or how, how does that work um, as you're as you're engaging globally on behalf of Phoenix as well? So Phoenix uh, opened an office in Mexico City with the state of Arizona, and at the time we had Democratic mayor and Republican governor, but we're able to work on that together, uh, and we have done uh, the outgoing governor and I were just in Mexico City at the same time, and and try to work together. TSMC was also multiple levels. Uh -huh. um, not related to our governor, but I was in Quebec this summer. Uh, CAE, which is one of, I think the largest aerospace training provider in the world is in Quebec, but has a significant presence. They had just committed to a large training center in Phoenix. And while I was there, they made a major announcement related to electric aviation. So as we address climate change, one of the areas where we are still doing work is Internet is travel and air travel mm. being particularly difficult because the batteries are heavy and it's just not conducive 
to long haul flights. Because we are a training center, we have a bunch of short flights in the greater Phoenix area where people just go up and come back to the same place. And um, CAE is making a major commitment, really the global leader in electric aviation, but a lot of that will be in Arizona and will help us address our climate change related mm -hmm. goals if we can move from a fossil fuel based petrol, uh, jet fuel to electric aviation with a cleaner fuel source that makes a big difference. And so that was a neat example of how we are working between Quebec and Arizona to nice. advance a mutual goal. Cross-border relationships are just mm -hmm. phenomenal. Um, other questions uh, right here. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm the Deputy Chief of Mission of the Singapore Embassy. So uh, really great to see the panelists here. Um, as the panelists have mentioned, you know, different states have a different strength and niche. I mean, for example, Singapore and the uh, Los Angeles city, we have an MOU on the overall economic cooperation, including establishing a green shipping corridor mm -hmm. with the port of, port of Los Angeles. And with Phoenix, we have a, a, a big detachment at, uh, in the Luke Air Force Base. So uh, what I'm talk what I wanted, um, you know, my question is really about the differences between a federal system and the state's independency. So you know, how do you, how does the uh, the the outfit that Ambassador Nina is actually leading right now? How do you reconcile the difference between what the federal government want to pursue, as well as the you know the independence of the different states, including the cities? That they are, you know, that they advocate for. So, and in this case, as member of the Deep Corp, I'm wondering, you know, sitting in Washington D.C., how could your outfit actually help the members of the Deep Corp navigate these different systems here? Thank you. Yeah, that's a, uh, an excellent question, um, and it also points out that it that the relationships don't have to be kind of city to city necessarily or, or governor to governor. They can also be city to, to national government. They can be, you know, city to governor in a different province. So, or, you know, so it's not, it doesn't, it's not necessarily always just like to like. That's what we found in LA anyway. We had agreements with a number of, of countries. Um, that is a an good question. I mean, we basically... Are, don't have authority to stop a governor or a mayor from doing what they want. Um, we can merely advise them um, and try to point them in the right direction, and um, uh, you know, and 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 hope that they, um, you know, uh, do things carefully and and with thought. That's about what we can do. So we're not really trying to, you know change people's priorities we're 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 helping them um with them you know if there are things that really contradict you know um u.s foreign policy then we probably won't help them but <laughs> but we're you know we have limited authority in terms of of trying to to you know stop them from doing something i don't know ambassador if you have a perspective on that question given that you you've got a federalist system as well so. yeah yeah, but I, I would like to mention something that we were talking with Nina this morning at the State Department, and it's the, the institution of sister cities. Mm. That's a, something that we all should keep in mind, because uh, I remember in 1990, 1991, I chaired the, the, the process of uh, making an agreement w between Tel Aviv and Buenos Aires, 1991. So you, now you, you have a clear idea of how old am I, but uh, how old I am. But um, in, in that year, Buenos Aires started, uh, we were paving a way for the development, the associated development between the two cities, Tel Aviv and Buenos Aires. Not only because we have a very important Jewish community in Argentina, but also because in the technological field, the, 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 the two cities are complementary to each, to each other. So we started 30 years ago, 40 years ago, we started a, 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 to work together and uh, we have proven positive results. Uh, so the cooperation between the two cities and using the sister cities mechanism has proven to be very important too. 
and it's needed uh, to, to move on forward uh, all over, no? Um, thank you. Um, other, other questions? And uh, I've got one there, and then we'll also go to the back. And do we have questions from the uh, chat as well? Yes. Okay. From the virtual audience, we have one for Ambassador Hesheyan from Ambassador Sarah Mendelssohn of Carnegie Mellon University. <laughs> The question says, will the letter that Ambassador Hashidian is organizing for the Summit for Democracy on Mayors and Democracy include any references to the SDGs? There is also another one from Hannah Vos. Uh, Ambassador ha Nina Hashidian mentioned working with diaspora groups while Deputy Mayor for International Affairs, which leads me to ask, are there efforts to build some national philanthropic partnerships as well, whether on city or state level? Uh, yes to the second question. And on the first question, I don't recall. I have looked, I looked at that declaration a while back, um, but you can find it on the, um, the uh, German Marshall Fund's website. I think it's G, um, German Marshall Fund, gmfus.org slash mayors for democracy. I think that's where you can find the text and also the way mayors can sign up for it. So, so we, can, we, can get, we can lobby mayors to get sustainable development goals in there. Gladly. <laughs> um, uh, we had a question here and then I'll also go back to the back row because we've, uh, we've had hands up back there as well. Good evening, thank you for the interesting discussion. My name is Oleksandra Koidel. I am assistant professor at the Kiev School of Economics and I'm also here a research visiting scholar at the George Washington University. So I uh, will speak, uh, when I heard Ambassador Hashigan, when you mentioned that there are two pillars you will work on, on climate and democracy, I was excited about the second one, in fact, because I research now the resilience of Ukrainian municipalities mm -hmm. during the time of war, and we see that the previous experience of democratic governance at the local level excuse me, allows them now to mobilize local resources and businesses for the defense and resilience and uh, tackling multiple crises. Mm -hmm. And so my question is whether you've been thinking about democracy in a, this kind of maybe bit of a pragmatic way more like collaborative governance, and what exactly do you envisage when you say that this will be the, the pillar for, 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 your, uh, for your work, and maybe for the, for the mayors and uh, for, uh, uh, for the ambassador? The question is whether you see democracy as one of the pillars where you are working as, as part of subnational diplomacy. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really think that it's, it's you know, mayors and governors who show that democracy delivers and show that government delivers, and and, um, that's, that's kind of the fundamental piece, I think, where they are the ones who are touching people the closest. And so if they are delivering that, that in turn, um, you know, engenders, uh, more belief in the system. And that's, that's one angle from which we're thinking about it. I think our first engage, you know, our first thought is to, is to try to make sure that there is participation from, um, subnational leaders at the Summit for Democracy, uh, which will be coming up. And um, I've certainly, I mean, I've been so just impressed and um, amazed by the, the leaders in, in Ukraine, really, about mm -hmm. and how just essential that they have been. Um, I hadn't really thought about the fact that, I hadn't thought about the point that you just made, but of course that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm that because they have, um, you know, had been working on democratic systems that they are then able to have trust of their people and mobilize their people, et cetera. So, um, but we're always open to other ideas, so uh, feel free to, to send them our way. Do you have a <coughs> perspective on this? We are very much thinking about democracy. The U.S. Conference of Mayors has now done several convenings with Ukraine, uh, President has spoken to us, and then we've had mayor-to-mayor -mayor convenings, which are some of the more powerful meetings to talk to someone who is in a warm zone and sort of get, um, I had a meeting in December uh, on the day that I, I think there were 12 rockets shot down, and mm -hmm. just sort of hearing that perspective from a local elected official of what it means when 
you've had a major defense victory, and that day was, uh, frankly, put a lot of perspective in my day about what challenges we still have to face, but also how important local government is on the worst possible days. We now also get, unfortunately, more questions about democracy in the United States when I have conversations mm -hmm. globally and trying to put the January 6th events into perspective. We, we have a lot to share. It was not something when I first became an elected official that was on the forefront for me. It was maybe something I took for granted, but now is quite clearly something we have to mm -hmm. aggressively defend. Um, we, as mayors, particularly in a community like mine, have to have real conversations about election security and how to make sure people who co count the votes are protected. And that's something I have in common with people all over the world. So it's uh, sometimes your most stressful moments can also be a place where you can really find shared conversations. And, and it's helpful for me also to understand what is happening in the country of origin of many of the people who live in my community. Uh, we are leaders in refugee resettlement in the city of Phoenix. Um, in our case, we have many people who have come from Africa and who still feel very closely tied to the communities where they were born. And so sometimes when there's major events in those countries, it really impacts the diaspora in my community. And just having a better global understanding makes me better able to serve those communities. I was thrilled when President Biden announced the council for the African diaspora, I think mm -hmm. is that the right mm -hmm. name, at, at the last summit, because I think we need to have stronger ties and honor those to better serve our communities, and it's been a real focus of this administration as well as understanding local governments. Mm -hmm. To me, this feels like a State Department that really appreciates that diplomacy happens at neighborhood meetings, in city <laughs> councils, and governor's mansions, in addition to happening in embassies, and that's a really important recognition that I have not seen before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, regarding the, the Ukraine, the question, uh, I agree with everything, everything that Kate and Nina had said about the consequences and the situation created in Ukraine after the Russian invasion. Clearly, there, there is a, a, a big work to be done by also the cities, because when we talk about the cooperation between cities or provinces, states, sub-regional realities, we do not only talk about values, democracy, for example. I would like to stress that we also talk about interest, business possibilities, exchange possibilities, the possibility of growing together the two parts of the, of the agreement. So I think we are facing a new, a new process that, I, that, that is growing in the, in the world and te uh, trends to connect different players from different parts of the world. And uh, you can see how there is some, uh, oh, uh, I'm trying to say hom homogeneous, <laughs> some homogeneous uh, definitions uh, as a result, as an outcome of these uh, different exchanges. So I think we are facing a very positive new experience in the world. Excellent. Um, additional questions? And do we have, uh, just before we do that, do we have additional <coughs> questions from online? Or, okay. Um, I want to go to the back row here because they've had, she had her ro hand up for. Thank you very much for the panel today. I'm Carla Cabrera, a PhD candidate at Georgetown University studying public diplomacy. Mm -hmm. So I'm very interested in the work that the USA Department is doing with the subnational diplomacy and all the relations to majors, governors, and all these subnational mm -hmm. actors that play a role in the global ar arena. And my research focuses mainly on intercultural competences. So I was wondering if uh, the work and support that the State Department gives to mayors and governors also includes trainings and guidance on intercultural competences to recognize those cultural differences, not only when playing a role in the international arena, but also 
as Mayor Gallego said, with the communities that we have in the U.S. that belong to different diasporas and different communities. Thank you. That's a great idea. No, we have we're not doing that yet, but I will put it. I will jot it down as a <laughs> as a good possible thing for us to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, in addition to the the intercultural. Um, uh, competencies also just the the intelligence that comes with uh, what the State Department is always engaged on with other countries as well and and helping that guide mayors and and uh, local jurisdictional officials as mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. um, it's, it's um, sort of an infinite mission because there's always right. <laughs> yeah, new <laughs> issues <laughs> Nina, I mean, you need, we, we need to get you a lot more people. <laughs> Just the diversity of I'll things that come for us in local government, it even surprises yeah. me. Mm -hmm. In my early, my first year as an elected official, I decided I was going to be really progressive and have a meeting with the Somali community. Mm -hmm. And I didn't appreciate we really have more than one mm -hmm. Somali community in mm -hmm. Phoenix. Uh -huh. And there were some challenges going on in Somalia that made it more difficult to try to bring mm -hmm. everyone together. And I again, thought I was doing a great job reaching out what I thought was narrowly, but then bringing everyone together, I didn't appreciate mm -hmm. some of the tensions in that area. And it is just such a wide world and, and so many different things happening that uh, we could have a, a whole army of folks to support mm -hmm. local government and I would, I would be yes, thrilled, yes. but well, maybe uh, army is the wrong word choice. So, <laughs> so far, um, I found that our State Department colleagues are really eager to help. So, you know, no part of the world is, is uh, mm -hmm. out of our jurisdiction. Well, you've just gotten the rationale for, for doing yeah. some of that intercultural <laughs> training. Um, ambassador. No, now I'm realizing, we didn't talk about this this morning, Nina, but I want you to know that the U.S. have a great ambassador in Buenos Aires. He's a man from uh, Texas, from Texas. His name is Mark Stanley. He's a friend of mine. We work a lot together, and w right now, I didn't, I didn't mention it this morning, but we are working on the, uh, on the connection of different cities from the interior of different provinces with different uh, cities in, in the U.S. Okay. So I think we, the, the three of us should uh, have a video conference. Eh? I'm going to see him this weekend because I'm flying, as I said, I'm flying to Buenos Aires. But I think I will talk to him about this possibility. And uh, I think that this is a nice consequence of this gathering with <laughs> all of you, no? <laughs> uh, that's a new idea, a new, uh, a, a new possibility. <laughs> well, and I think that is the perfect note to end on. <laughs> um, you all have been patient. We've gone a little bit over time because it's been such a rich discussion. And I, I've really loved having actually these different perspectives. The perspectives of uh, of an ambassador, the perspective of a of a current and sitting mayor, and then Nina, you've just you you've really uh, covered the waterfront in in the different things that you have done, both at the State Department and also at the City of Los Angeles. So please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs> <laughs> And um, thanks to all of you who have been watching online. Thanks, thanks to you in the audience. Thank you for your thoughtful questions. Um, a big thanks to the Meridian International Center for hosting us and for partnering with us yeah. at the Brookings Center for Sustainable Development. For those of you who are, who are here, um, we hope that you'll stay a bit and, uh, and socialize. We, uh, we have some drinks and a little bit of food for us to be able to spend some time together. For those of you who are online, we, we, uh, we bid you farewell right now. <laughs> but thank you. Uh, thanks very much. And thanks oh, yeah. to all of you. It's been wonderful. Oh, yeah. <laughs>